So to follow that up, really pleased to have um, Guy Harris here from Accessible PRS, who's going to talk about um, his experiences of accessibility in the private rented sector. So um, over to you, Guy. Great. Thank you, Paul. Afternoon, everyone. I'm Guy Harris and I run Accessible PRS. We work with landlords, investors, developers and architects to increase the supply of wheelchair accessible homes and make it easier for wheelchair users to rent privately. The private rented sector is key to helping disabled people find suitable homes because it offers diversity. That's in terms of types of property, tenure, geographic location, and also investment motivations. And the numbers are significant with 4.6 million households renting privately between 2019 and 2020. Uh, yet research we did at Abode Impact sh uh, showed that 91% of wheelchair users who looked to, that we surveyed, struggled to access the private rented sector. The rental market is far from straightforward. Housing stock is mostly inaccessible. There are many layers of people and professionals within property and a fast moving private rented sector that has evolved to be competitive in a way which puts disabled people at an intrinsic disadvantage for viewing and securing properties. Most people within the sector have no experience with disability. So even when there is good intention, it's unlikely to survive the process. So how do we turn it around? Let's start with the property owners. If this group can be persuaded that it's in their interest to own accessible properties, they'll do it. So why aren't they holding accessible properties? Well, most of us invest in areas we know and understand. Accessibility is becoming a thing, though the terminology can be confusing, especially when used interchangeably where it's not interchangeable. Plus, there's a confusing amount of information and misinformation online. So we must be clear what we mean, what we broadcast and how we define. We have huge and ongoing education and awareness work. If you're building new or totally renovating properties, including basic accessibility features doesn't cost much more, but a lot of existing rental stock is in reasonable condition and adding meaningful wheelchair access does cost more. And we don't want to penalize the wheelchair user with a higher than market rent to cover these costs. So understanding this, we can identify points of opportunity and educate and engage smaller builders and developers. Pervasive myths around disability are still commonplace. If you're doing fine without accessible properties in your portfolio, there's no real incentive to change what you're doing. So this is where we need to demonstrate how things can be done with good case studies. And this is what Mira was talking about. Next slide, please. So competing demands could be physical, like the value of an additional bedroom over an accessible design within the same space, or systemic, like an agent racing to secure a deal with a non-disabled person before a competing agent gets there first. This is the realities of their income and career development. Um, we exist in echo chambers, it's quite reasonable to assume that stuff we broadcast on social media uh, posts are only reaching each other. So we must proactively reach outside our networks and comfort zones and sell the idea to new clients. This is business development after all. We absolutely can address all concerns and find opportunities to keep increasing the number of accessible properties in the marketplace. But we need to be realistic and credible in our approach, as this provides confidence to property owners and professionals. As an example, when I was an estate agent in 2000, showing a riverside flat in an old block to an applicant, it had been on with multiple agents for a while and was difficult to sell because of the halfway state it was in. Buyers couldn't work out what would be involved. So we were discussing the possibilities and I didn't think it was going anywhere until he asked my opinion on the cost of a refurb. I suggested a significant but realistic amount and justified it. This was enough, and he put in an immediate and successful offer. Our private rented sector property owners have to feel confident that we have thought through their whole process from buying, renovating, tenant sourcing, and property trends generally, and that we're acting in their best interests. Otherwise, they'll stick with their existing professionals. I'd also like to suggest that disability organisations that hold general needs housing stock consider why they're not changing it for accessible housing. On the other hand, we have the wheelchair users as tenants who all have differing needs. 
that we can go a long way to establishing broad design expectations and enabling them to carry out further works. Here, as with general needs housing, their budgets and their aspirations need to be aligned to avoid a seriously comp compromised result, though as you'd expect, it's more complex than this. For example, I've spoken with a number of wheelchair users who need to move for work, but have a care package. This means that one, they need to be within a certain proximity to work, a cost factor, or the care agency refuses to supply PAs as their day becomes too long. Two, they need a second bedroom for a carer, which tips them too far beyond their budget, effectively penalizing them for their disabling condition. And three, because they're moving to a new area, neither local authority wants to help. And then there's the whole matchmaking process. We need to find a consistent way to handle the geographic spread of inquiries, the different agents and the property platforms. And it isn't as simple as having a filter checkbox that says accessible. We've explored this in detail with the Right Move development team. In any case, how do you define accessible in a secondhand property? I've rented a house uh, where I couldn't get upstairs and there was a big step at the front and back doors and which had a cubicle shower downstairs, so I'm a wheelchair user. But because we were the first through the door and spoke to the delightful landlord, we were able to make changes that suited us back then, and it worked for four years. This was a happy result after 11 months of searching, frustration, and despair. Would that property have been visible with an accessible filter? I don't know. And that's the point. Who would know? So we can find ways to adapt properties, but if we want to scale accessibility in the private rented sector, there may need to be earnest public collaboration and a forward thinking approach between government or local authorities and landlords. Disabled facilities grants are excellent when they work, but I see a gap where we could be lining up properties for incoming but known tenants. Housing can make the difference between a virtuous or a vicious cycle for a wheelchair user. One is likely to be cost positive for the treasury though clearly this still requires joined up thinking between different departments. So we've been working through uh, the processes of how we can dovetail landlord, property and tenant. We speak with different stakeholders and professionals and each of our conversations informs the next. And we've mapped out two routes for our business. One is a tailored service for our landlords and registered tenants. So as an example, we're working with Abode Impact who are launching a pilot portfolio this year. This is significant because it will test their model and if successful, open the way for institutional investment. However, it will initially be limited in terms of both locations and property types. And it's worth stating that Abode is being very careful not to ghettoize disabled people. We're also working with smaller scale landlords, which I'm just as excited about as these offer diversity of properties. So rather than it being a case of you're disabled, therefore you must live in X type of property. Our other route is to change the landscape more generally within the private rented sector. So we're looking at the matchmaking part of the process. We're about to launch a scheme that will level the playing field for disabled people in the mainstream letting market. This is a bigger project that will be a game changer, though I have no doubt it will throw up plenty of ongoing challenges. I think it's important to recognize or to understand that as we're not starting with a blank sheet with the private rented sector, we accept what is realistic and stay focused on the changes we can make. We can't solve this overnight, but we can find ways to enable tenants to access clear property information online and make informed choices for themselves without needing to call the letting agent. So for example, while we addressed concerns that all properties must be absolutely right. Some tenants told us differently. They knew the limitations of their budget, but wanted say location over space or could manage a standard bath. So our aim at Accessible PRS is to bring these relevant people together so that both property owners and tenants have all their answers in one place. I see gains in terms of step change improvements must be locked in and become the new lowest level. Um, our, our work means collaborating, which I like. 
partly because it's going to take joined up thinking to make headway and partly because I believe that we get better results working together. The more people who are involved, the faster accessibility becomes familiar and therefore a normality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guy, for it. very interesting and, in, and informative. So have you seen the, your, your kind of spider's web? Do, does that work or where, where have you seen it kind of working best at the moment, do you think? So what I'm doing at the moment is um, problem solving. I have lots of people coming to me saying, telling me their situations or the complexity of their situations or going out and saying, well, if I can, you know, in order to, in order to get the right properties or the right landlords, what, what has to happen? You know, what are the blocks that are happening? And there's, there's a lot of willingness out there and there are a lot of people in different areas um, whether I engage with new people and say, you know, have you considered this? You're doing great things. But each, each kind of stakeholder has a set of issues. And so although it's kind of slow to get going, I'm having to go around all those different people and say, right, okay, hang on, what's, what's your problem here? And um, what can we do about it? And then start to join up those dots, um, which, you know, it's, it's not insurmountable. It's, it's doable, but it's, it's trying to bring a lot of moving pieces together at the same time. And, and it's doing something new. Yeah. yeah which, is, which is always a, or can always be a challenge, can't it? Yeah. Um, th there's obviously a lot of local authority people here on, on the webinar today. Mm. Um, is is the, are the kind of thing asks from local authorities that, that you would make to make this process work better for, for the people you work with? Yeah, I think this is really interesting. And, and, you know, adding on to what Mira was saying, um, and I didn't know about those pilot products, uh, projects, so I'm, I'm really excited to see that. You know, for example, a, a recent landlord rang me, uh, had a bungalow in, in Bournemouth, was really motivated to, uh, to house a wheelchair user, but the, but the bungalow needs some reconfiguration. And the cost of the works would be within the scope of DFG, but it's too much for him. You know, it, it affects his, his yield too much. And that's the reality of, of, you know, the private rented sector. So if I knew there was a way of, um, you know, connecting up those dots and saying, and, and saying, you know, going to the local authority and saying, look, I have a registered tenant. They want to live in this area. I have a landlord who, you know, wants to house that tenant. Can we do an assessment while their existing tenant is still in there, but has handed in notice and then uh, dovetail in the works, get it all done, set up in, a, in an efficient and, and timely manner, and then move that tenant off uh, a kind of a, a problem waiting list and into, into, a, into a house that's, that exists. It's there. Yeah. Uh, it, just need, it just needs that. Uh, that extra, extra financial help and, and can kind of those different departments see that as yes we, we it might look as if we're subsidizing the private sector but actually we're, we're uh, you know we're getting a cost saving elsewhere so it, it's, it's, it's effective and it works. Yeah so do, do you see that um, I think probably the answer is no do you see that level of kind of joined up this across budgets and, and kind of willing to do I um, see it no yeah, no, no. <laughs> I mean you, you know I, I see I see some really interesting some really complex situations and i see despair frustration um you know anxiety uh, um some time ago i i had the the kind of the pleasure of 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 being um involved in in flats in germany in that rental market there and their whole approach to the balance and the security between landlord and tenant was was riveting and you know people with wheelchair you know wheelchair users fundamentally need security um and more so than i would say you know non-disabled people because of the complexities that that um we you know disability can can add to the mix and so if we can uh offer wheelchair users some form of you know security of tenure um or security of property because i'm seeing lots of um registrations now where landlords are selling and it's it's whipping the rug from under their feet mm. but but tie that in with um local authority help so that you know the landlord gets something the tenant gets something and and the local authority or the treasury gets something like it, it, it's a no-brainer but it's a it's a complex piece to put together 
Yeah, I mean, I think there were probably some bits and pieces around the DFG legislation that, that aren't particularly helpful in terms of when you can approve a grant and, and somebody's having a new tenancy, that um, using discretion in a local area would be, would be quite helpful to get around. Um, but fair? also a, a, a willingness, though, and an understanding of, of, of the problem. Like, I, you know, I think at the moment, many of the issues are... <clears throat> There, um, everyone knows the issues, but it's it's in no individual organisations or departments remit to solve the issues. So everyone can say, "Yeah, look, we get it. It's hard, but not my problem. Like we don't have the resources." Rather than, you know, booking a room and saying, "Okay, jointly, like we have a responsibility to house people in in safe and and, and acceptable standard housing." How are we going to fix this problem? And, and, and that question being fundamental to, to the process, you know, we, we have, between us, we have the resources, uh, you know, if we need to go out to the private sector and involve um, other, other people, then what, it, what does it need to, uh, to, to do that joined up thinking? So do you, do you think there'll be kind of landlords that will be interested in kind of creating accessible housing as, as kind of... A- I, I don't think it, I know it, yeah. I, but, you, but, but there are, you know... If, if you want private money to get involved, then each each set of investors will come with their own eligibility criteria. criteria. You know, if we're, and, and that really can vary wildly, but yes, there's plenty of enthusiasm. Um, it, it just, it, it, it needs a little bit of, it needs help. Yeah. Did you think it would work on the scale of, a, of an individual local authority or would you, would you need a bigger... Um, kind of catchment area to, to make it big enough to, to I think I think it. it's I think it can work at a local authority level but I also think there needs to be consistency across local authorities you know if someone's in Salford and someone else is in South End yeah uh, actually they need the same you, you know they need the, the same level of, of of housing and and you know like someone I spoke to this morning uh, whose landlord is selling uh, but but when I was digging deeper, like this, what he's accepting because of the area has gone up in value and the reason he needs to be there, what he's accepting for a lower rent is is terrifying. And, mm. and you know, when I press further, like, you know, he'd, he'd been to a uh, local authority previously, got nothing. And so, you know, his options were really limited. And, you know, the... the we can solve these problems. Like we, we're we're a we're a developed country. We have wealth. Like the, the, these these stories aren't okay. These people's lives aren't okay. And I think I think there's an opportunity to work together. I, I'd love to work together. I mean, I think there's there's such a shortage of accessible stock in the social rented sector that it does seem that the private rented sector is a um, an alternative that is underutilized and, and could be so much more done with it. It is. I mean, it would help if actually we mandated more accessible housing through uh, planning regulations. But obviously, that's a conversation that is happening <laughs> at the moment. Yes, yes. I know there's a um, new report coming out today from the Centre for Social Justice that makes a whole raft of recommendations as part of the um, forthcoming um, all age disability strategy. So I think if, if anybody's looking for for a good read over over the over the rest of the week, I would. Um, recommend that alongside the um, NRLA report but uh, I, th- I think kind of the, if, if anybody else is particularly interested in taking forward these pilots there's um, I think there's a lot of potential there so um, I mean, if, certainly if, you, if you're interested in being an involved guy in the NRLA are then I, th- I think that there's some potential to do something amazing great let's do it great well thank you guy um, I think your Thanks, Paul. details um, will, will be shared in the chat if, if anybody wants to get in touch and uh, yeah, we'll certainly look forward to carrying on the conversation and see if we can um, see if we can make something happen fantastic I'd welcome all um, emails or calls thank you great thanks a lot